Hi, got an interesting teardown for you today. Thanks to John from Mordale here in Sydney for sending this one into the mailbag. It was too good for the mailbag. So we're doing a dedicated teardown video. We love aircraft in instrumentation teardowns because they're always rather fascinating. And this one's even more fascinating because it's Australian beauty. It's a Micro Air Avionics T2000 series. ATC RBS, um, otherwise known as a uh, transponder. It's an aircraft uh, transponder for this one's, I guess, for light or, you know, it's not for like your 747s or anything. It's more for light aircraft uh, transponder. And anyway, um, uh, designed and, and maybe made in Bundaberg in Queensland, world's best rum up in Bundaberg, Queensland for all you rum aficionados. Anyway, it does comply with uh, various standards around the world, so this isn't just an Australian one. Um, I have no idea if this is uh, operational or not. Anyway, it's a uh, transponder system that uh, is part of the air traffic uh, control, the uh, TCAS or the uh, you know collision avoidance uh, system where uh, the air traffic uh, controllers, they um, send it or other uh, planes for that matter, I can uh, send out a, a signal on 1,030 megahertz, and this thing's just continuously receiving 1,030 megahertz, uh, and then it'll actually, if it gets the signal, it'll respond with a uh, unique code and uh, the aircraft altitude as well, if you've got it in a certain mode. There are different uh, certain modes for this thing. Anyway, we've got antenna input um, and a D25 Output, I don't know what that is. Maybe some uh, RF adjustments would be uh, my guess anyway. Um, but yeah, so it receives on 1,030 megahertz and then it returns what's called the uh, squawk code on 1,090 megahertz. So that's how it returns the unique ID and you can actually set up, uh, your air tra if you enter a new air traffic control airspace, uh, they you know, should contact you and say, you know, please, they'll give you an identification and you apparently enter it here and stuff like that. Sorry, I don't, you know. I'm sure the uh, I, there's quite a lot of pilots on the who watch the EEV blogger and on the EEV blog forum. So I'm sure they'd uh, tell us all the technical details. But anyway, uh, it's got a dual line uh, dot matrix screen here. I have no idea if this one works. Um, and uh, but yeah, um, designed and probably manufactured here in Australia. So let's whack this open. And I think it's about 140 watts uh, total transmit power. That'd be like the peak, I guess, uh, something like that. Um, so yeah, designed to receive and transmit on the uh, one antenna. And well, let's crack her open. Nice screws on top and bottom. Uh, the front panel, yeah, that'll all pull out. It's very nice, as is common with uh, these aircraft instrumentations. There, I, I presume that these are like a standard uh, slot size that you put all your instruments in. They're designed to, like, you know, go into the uh, cockpit in, uh, well, you can put them anywhere, I guess, um, any location. And, uh, yeah, you dedicate a wire in harnesses, and then you can just um, chop and change or choose your different types of instruments, and they all fit into, like, a standard Rack size. I don't know. I haven't looked that up. I'm sure it's a standard size. Just sit right back and you hear a tale, a tale of a fateful teardown. One instrument had landed on the bench for a five hour teardown. A five hour teardown. Oh, and immediately we're in like Flynn. Look at that. Love it. All accessible. Beautiful. Shot in glorious 4K for your edification. And, uh, there's the crusty uh, D25. Can you see the shiny gloss on that board? Has that got a little bit of a conformal coating on it? Wouldn't surprise me to find a conformal coating there. So it's some sort of like option board. Don't really know. But uh, oh, a couple of MELFs down there. You know, I'm a MELF fanboy. Yeah, but obviously, given the uh, D25, so I haven't looked at the uh, pinout for this, so if I can find it, I'll whack it up there. But uh, yeah, obviously, this can interface with uh, various uh, GPSs like Garmin and others uh, to get the altitude, uh, like, you know, proper altitude information, or it can hook up to uh, barometric uh, pressure sensors, which you can get the um, altitude information from that. Anyway, not sure if that's part of a system, but uh, Genuine Hot's not up there, so to stop the TO220 flapping around, in the breeze another uh, <laughs> what's it they've bodged oh that's a that's a diode is it yeah it's a diode -y. 
And uh, yeah, they bodged that in. More hot snot down here. Once again, to stop the uh, capacitors uh, vibrating, flapping around in the breeze, because obviously you get a lot of vibration on an aircraft. Um, so, you know, if you just had a, a freestanding TO220 package like that, it would vibrate loose in next to no time. Trust me, I have experience in this where um, just stuff in a production environment that was wheeled around on a trolley, you know, even with like a trolley with big like pneumatic tires on it and stuff, the vibration of that, you know, doing that you know, every, you know, like for three shifts a day, every day for, you know, six months is a year or something was enough to just um, vibrate, just the, the TO220, it just vibrated loose and just like snapped off. It just, the fatigue on the legs of this thing, the vibration, it just hit the, you know, like it was the right resonant mode or something and it just eventually just... Um, yeah, fell off, so that happens. So anyway, um, yeah, nothing interesting there. We've got a processor. We might have a squiz. There you go. The microchip fanboys go wild to pick a 17C756, is it? Um, this design, by the way, dates from uh, 2000, so it, I think it's still in uh, production. Actually, I don't know. You know, these things often wouldn't uh, change over the time. This is the sort of application that you would have that would, um, you know, pretty much not change. You'd just keep buying the same PIC microchip part. That's why you can still buy, you know, PIC micros from, you know, 25, even 30 years ago maybe something like that so anyway not that unsurprising the pics have a good following um especially here in you know designed in australia this would have been like a go-to or microchip would have been a go-to uh micro solution back in uh 2000 stuff like that so uh yeah when was this one manufactured and of course you see how i peeled off the firmware sticker there and uh, it's like <laughs> left a big hole in the uh, conformal coat. Uh, for those who don't know, you uh, conformally coat boards to keep out uh, moisture from uh, being an issue and like, you know, causing leakage on a board and uh, you know, mix it with enough crud and you start getting uh, like low impedance shorts and that can ruin your day. So yeah, conformally coat uh, stuff, very uh, common to find in aircraft and military, things like that, you know, industrial stuff where moisture could be a problem. And this side here has to be our RF section. So, ta-da, oh, it's upside down. All the electrons are gonna fall out. Oh, there you go. Look at that. That's not your regular FR4 PCB, is it? No, sorry, Bob. And we've obviously got some distributed element uh, RF goodness going on here. Like that, for example, is a capacitor. A long trace like that is an inductor. You've got to remember at RF frequencies, even traces, they start becoming inductors. They start becoming capacitors. And when you have a large pad like that, so this is effectively, this could be, say, an inductor capacitor to ground because there'll be a ground plane under there and then another inductor so that could be an lc filter and actually it says uh receive filter input there uh plus 50 volts down there so no i was going to say is there like a masthead amp i don't think so um this is you know this is the big power jobby look at that it's obviously going it's bolted that'd be bolted down to the heatsink block which is uh underneath no doubt i'm um, absolutely sure of that looks like we've got a little tuned cap there so yeah that's our transmit section and this would be presumably our receive section if i can get that cap up that was a bit rude wasn't it uh there you go goes under oh oh okay right oh it comes back like that okay so it comes around like this controlling pins <laughs> and then oh okay and then it goes through a pin there all right that makes sense all right so that's incoming got an uh, the LC filter and then yeah that must bugger off onto the bottom side of the board so we really have to get this uh, board out but don't you love the ceramic power packages try and pull up some info on these um, yeah beautiful sure they cost a small fortune manufactured by nude virgins and uh, terrific I don't recognize the uh, symbol on there so but I'm sure if the RF aficionados do um, look at that that's interesting. Like, why that trace there with a whole bunch of vias and just a cap going over to it? That's fascinating. Hmm. Anyway, um, it's not a huge amount in the RF section. You know, you'd need an RF, uh, you know, a power amp 
uh, here and you need an RF uh, receiver and RF filters and that's about it. I mean, it's, you know, probably very simplistic. And there's the front guts of it. I love how uh, all that, look at that. That's just one big machined piece of aluminium there. Absolutely terrific. It's not many wires going off, but uh, there you go. That'd be another pick. There's absolutely no reason to suspect uh, that wouldn't be. Probably be the same part for bomb reuse, is it? Yep, you betcha that's the same. No wackers. And not much else. I'm sure they'd have uh, good quality encoders, you know, Alps or something like that, perhaps. And that's just a little LCD backlight down there. And that's just the LCD interface connector. That's all she wrote, but anyway, it's a uh, nice, neat little compact design. I really like it. Well, there you go. That's obviously a specific power supply board. I, didn't, I thought it was integrated with this one before, but it's not. It's its own interface. And this little puppy here is not going to reveal what it is. Hmm. Aha, uh -huh, this starts to get interesting. You'll see that the D connector is... Attached to the, well, it's not attached to, but, you know, it's surrounded by that metal plate on the back, and then that, ah, oh, bloody hot snot, and then that just pops out like that. Got a little, oh, a bit of insulation there, and uh, discrete wiring inside this thing. Not unusual uh, to find something like that. Oh, look at the MELF resistors. Oh, i got to love the MELF. MELF, MELF. Elf. That'd be a <laughs> real pain if you forgot to put that uh, back plate on before you actually soldered that D connector in. Um, yeah, that'd ruin your day. <laughs> but <laughs> been there, done that kind of thing. So there you go. There's a little slot in there which is not wide enough for the connector, but oh, it's got some ferrites on there too. But I'm sure if you whack it through. At an angle, you could eventually get that out, so or in or out. So yeah, it's all sort of uh, integrated together. Of course, um, you know, price is no object, so they're not optimizing this thing for uh, you know high volume assembly or something like that. I don't, you know, they'd only make like thousands of these a year or something. It wouldn't be uh, you know hundreds of thousands. So. Anyway, uh, yeah, so, you know, look, that wire's soldered. That's a power supply output, obviously, going over to the uh, transmit and uh, the RF board. And it's just got wires soldered on there. So, yeah, you've got to uh, desolder those. So there's a specific uh, assembly step and a specific unassembly step, which involves soldering. Hmm. Yeah, so it looks like we're going to have a transmit block here and a receive block over there, and little uh, penetrators going through, each with little uh, ferrites on them. That'd just be for uh, power and uh, maybe some uh, control and signal, and that's about it. And there we go, there's the bottom of our board. You can see that penetrator come in, what I uh, presume is the transmit block here, and this would be the uh, receive block. A couple of little 10 turn trimmers down in there, and uh, Oh, is that some 74H logic? Nothing particularly special down in there at all. There's a bit of analogy goodness, maybe a couple of op amps and things, but uh, not much. Again, this is on a special, uh, you know, like a probably some sort of Rogers uh, controlled impedance material. They're tightly specifying this, no doubt. You wouldn't just farm this out to one of the $5 PCB makers in China, that's for sure. Um, no, you'd want to uh, it'd all be specifically saying, yep, I want this Rogers material XXXX, um, and yes, please. If you desolder the penetrator down in there, you get the board out. Uh, 11.3, is that 11? I, oh, I don't know if that's, no. It's as a serial number, triple one three. 1113, don't know what that is, um, but yeah, you get that out, and uh, yep, it's all um, no traces on the bottom there. Of course, that could be a multi layer board, I don't think it is. I think it's all that's a yeah, I think that's a single layer jobby. There it is for those playing along at home, capture that in 4K. 
But yeah, you can see the, uh, you know, serious RF engineering, the uh, typical cans, you know, if you do like, I've done, spe I might have to link in like a good spectrum analyzer, uh, tear down on stuff like this. And you'll find these sort of, you know, individually uh, shielded modules like this on controlled impedance boards with uh, penetrators, uh, the uh, go-to thing for getting uh, signal and power between modules. Two stubborn screws in there, but this will all pop out. So this is the shielded can. Oh, there we go. No wackers. Oh, oh, there we go. There's our channels. Oh, okay. Aha, uh -huh. check it out. This is where the input from our board came in. So this is obviously some sort of uh, cavity filter. They call it a cavity filter because there's actually a cavity in there. It's an RS cavity filter. Um, I've uh, seen these as like um, like a tubular coaxial uh, type ones, but yeah, look, you can see that each element has a tuned slug inside, so you're able to tune each one. So that's like a five element tuned cavity RF filter. Isn't that fascinating through there? So there you go, that's what's on this side. And it looks like there's another one under there, is there? I can't see any other reason for these shorties here. Um, hmm, well, I wouldn't expect it. Like a, like a five stage cavity filter in, in something like this. I thought it was a you know, fairly simplistic application, but, but maybe they need this to get uh, the discrimination uh, required, so. Um, yeah, on the transmit side or the receive side. I assume it's the receive side. Yes, Dave, of course it's the re receive side because A, um, we saw the power transistor going directly to the output before and this, if I flip this over, you might remember that. There you go, there's our RF filter. So here's our input coming back from our uh, receive, uh, coming back from our antenna. This is our input, controlled impedance trace, little itty bitty element filter there on the board and then that goes into oh yeah the receive filter input and that is our receive filter looks like you know a five stage um rf cavity filter tuned look at that wow so some gray bearded nude virgin at the factory has to uh, sit there and tune all those brilliant and i'm going to get this board out of here too but everything has a procedure so i've got to get this <laughs> bnc off before i can desolder the pin on the other side to then angle the board out so yeah we're gonna have a little leftover bits all right i got the pin down there desoldered the all the screws out and everything and flappity doo da oh hello Hello, um, <laughs> the surprises aren't done yet. The RF goodness got a bit of rigid coax there. Isn't that fascinating? Wow. I, I would not have expected that at all. But anyway, aren't these just beautiful machined blocks? Absolutely fantastic. Obviously, this is the uh, base of our uh, output power transistor there. As I said, it just goes down to the main block. Use the entire case as a heatsink. But uh, what is, what's that Richard Coax doing? Hmm. So check this out. It seems to go from over this point to over to here, which the only thing it seems to go to is a little trimmer cap on the end there. So is that some sort of like tuned stub? Something like that, perhaps. Wow, fascinating, huh? Fellow engineers, pray with me. Um, 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 um. So there you go, if you are uh, tuned cap aficionados, there you go. That's just like right on the end of that rigid coax there. So, yep. And it comes from the output of this bad boy here. I presume it's an output. Lots of little ohm bridges, I'll call them. Why not? 4K screenshot. Aha, uh -huh. I originally thought that this was a cavity uh, filter, 
but it's not. It is a, a what looks like a comb, what's called a comb line uh, filter, and you only notice this if you get it out. And you can see the um, the ports down here. They've got little plastic uh, sleeves inside to then put the little uh, tune in. Well, they're usually, you know, they're often like screws, tuning uh, screws. But in this case, these little aluminium pins just slide inside there and they cut them off to a certain length and they tune uh, these. So some grey bearded uh, nude virgin sits there and uh, tunes these things and then they seal them up with the um, uh, plastic on the end by the looks of it. And But the interesting thing about this is that I was wondering why, like, these lengths down here were different lengths and I thought well maybe it formed part of the cavity you know because when it was all together I thought oh you know maybe it's all like shares a cavity but it doesn't and you'll notice that there's no insulation here whatsoever so this is all connected to the chassis block this is just basically well there is a, a hole in the middle of going down here but apart from that look at the pins okay the pins, there you go, they're just soldered onto the aluminium block there. That's it. It's not like they go through any insulation to a cavity inside. This, I believe, is a comb filter. I'm sure the RF uh, aficionados will correct uh, me down below in the comments. But basically, um, this always freaks me out, right? Because this is actually connected down to, like, this chassis is grounded. So effectively, what you're doing is shorting the output of the antenna. Here it is. The output of the antenna, okay, <laughs> is going basically through copper, through copper. Sure, these are little inductors, right? And you've got an LC filter there, but then that goes directly <clears throat> into here. So you're basically at DC, mind you, <laughs> hold on to your hat before you launch into the comments, uh, DC, um, then it's your shorting the antenna output directly to there. But basically, it comes into here, but because it's one gig, but even shorting direct, effectively shorting directly to ground here, uh-uh, you ain't doing that at one gigahertz, right? So it's um, effectively, I'm surprised it's like, it's not going into like the top bit here. I'm sure the uh, RF aficionados will uh, tell us why. But anyway, it's going, um, it, it's basically going directly into here. And then they're using these as also um, part of the uh, tuned comb. So this is a uh, comb filter. And uh, here's some, like I found an online comb filter calculator. It's not accurate, but you know, just here's some uh, possible, you know, you can calculate uh, these sort of things and how they work and you can get different types of uh, comb filters and things like that. But yeah, this is shorted directly to the chassis. You got the signal. It's, this always freaks me out. Like it, it's just, you know, it's, it's RF voodoo, right? When you have the output of the antenna shorted directly to your metal case, yet it works because it's one gig and things operate very differently at high frequency, but yeah, that's it. There you go. It's a comb filter with some of the combs actually, you know, um, milled into the grounded chassis. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, yeah, anyway, I'm sure the, the RF aficionados are really getting excited about that one because that, that really is just amazing. I'd love to uh, talk with the uh, designer about that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm just surprised um, to find this sort of thing in just a, you know, a one gig uh, transmitter and receiver. Well, th this is a receiver filter. It's not a transmit filter. So very interesting. Please leave it in the comments if you've got more detail on that. So there you go. That's absolutely fascinating uh, teardown. And I'm sure a lot of our RF aficionados will uh, really appreciate the uh, design effort that's gone into this uh, bad boy. There you go. Single-sided board. If anyone can uh, recognize the material, please leave it in the comments. But uh, yeah, um, that's much more rf -y goodness and um, certainly more screws. Look at all the look at all the screws and washers and, and things that I expected to find in here. I expected, you know, an output power tranny to be bolted to the 
uh, chassis and that's about it. I didn't expect like uh, cavity filters and um, other stuff that we're seeing in here. So anyway, um, if you've got any idea why they need to go to that sort of effort, as I, I can only think that, you know, it's uh, discrimination, uh, signal discrimination uh, requirements for, uh, you know, the standards or whatnot. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. So yeah, cavity receiver and the output uh, power driver. What is it, like a three-stage or two-stage thing or uh, something like that? Anyway, I'm sure somebody will analyze that. So as I said, always very interesting, these uh, industry-specific bits of kit. Aircraft electronics, absolutely fascinating. So if you like that, please give it a big thumbs up. As always, you can discuss down below in the comments or over on the EEV blog forum, which each forum, each video gets its own uh, forum thread to discuss. That's what I've been doing for the last 12 years, almost since day dot. And if you haven't joined the EV blog forum, join it. And if you haven't joined my other channels over here, please do. I'm currently like 44,000 subs on Odyssey or something like that. So I'm still like like top 10 in the world for Odyssey. Our subscribers growing hugely. And I very rarely say it, but thank you to all my uh, patrons as well. I've got like 1,300 uh, patrons. Oh, the link is always uh, down below. And Subscribestar as well. Not a uh, huge growth on uh, Subscribestar, but I've got like 17 uh, subscribers over there on Subscribestar. So thank you very much for all those who support the channel. Catch you next time.